Good morning. Great to see you all in person. First time in a couple of years, so glad to get started. I'm David Tice, the World Bank's Press Secretary, and thank you for joining the 2022 Annual Meetings Press Conference with World Bank Group President David Mulpass. Mr. Mulpass will give opening remarks and then we will turn to questions. And because Mr. Mulpass values transparency, I should also add that if you're interested in following his remarks, comments on global policy, readouts from country meetings, you should follow him on Twitter at David Mulpass WBG. Um, thanks to those who have sent questions in advance online, I will try to get to those as well as everyone in the room. And if I can ask, please keep to one question per outlet and identify yourself and your outlet before asking your question. Uh, thanks very much. Hope everyone's keeping well. Mr. Malpass. Thanks, David. Um, good morning, everybody. So the, the global environment, as you know, is very challenging. In fact, it's grim for developing countries. I, I think there's a crisis facing development. We put out our poverty numbers uh, uh, last week, so showing 70 million more people in extreme poverty and median income going down by four-tenths of a percent. That's the first decline in the records that, we've, that the World Bank's been keeping since 1990. The growth rate, we've lowered our 2023 growth forecast from 3% to 1.9% for global growth. Uh, that's that's uh, uh, dangerously close to a world recession, and that uh, world recession could happen under certain circumstances. Uh, all of the problems that, uh, that people have taken note of, the inflation problem, the interest rate rises, uh, and the, the cutoff of capital flows to developing world hits the poor hard. And so that's a, that's a huge challenge for the World Bank. We are, we, we are focused on helping people get ahead in developing countries, and right now there have been reversals. Um, the, the countries, of course, are all different, so we'll have a discussion today of certain countries, so it's not monolithic at all. Uh, uh, some countries have already been raising their interest rates and may, may be reaching a point where they don't have to keep raising. Some countries have done one kind of subsidy versus another kind of subsidy, uh, and so and, and, uh, fiscal policies are are different throughout, and also very importantly, some countries are commodity producers and some are uh, commodity buyers. Um, so we've, in general, advocated for countries that, when as as they address the crisis, that they try to have targeted uh, targeted responses. That means support for the poor. Uh, that means uh, uh, interventions that are targeted, and also are are uh, there's an exit strategy. They're temporary. Um, and uh, I wanted to mention several things going on, and I, I won't elaborate, and then we can do it in questions. One is the buildup of debt for developing countries, and I went through why that is. Interest rates up, uh, the, the amount of debt the itself is up, and their currencies tend to be weakening. The depreciation of the currency adds to the burden of the debt. We have a fifth wave of debt crisis uh, facing the developing world. Uh, second, there was, there's been a lot of discussion on Ukraine. The World Bank is in the in the middle. It, it's the uh, it, the primary conduit for the transfer of funds to the administrative side of the Ukrainian government, and we had good conversations yesterday on that. We've set up a, a, a yet another trust fund so that we can absorb money from uh, various parts of the world donor community. Very important going uh, what's going on on education. We, ha as you know, learning poverty is up. Uh, World Bank is, uh, has kept uh, extensive data on the reversals going on in education, and so we had a, an important uh, event uh, to discuss the principles of getting out of that uh, crisis. Um, on climate, we've had extensive uh, interaction. As, as you may know, the World Bank is the, the, the biggest uh, funder of climate action. We, we uh, are proposing at this uh, meeting a, uh, a, a new trust fund called SCALE that would allow the world to, the, the global community, to put funding into global public goods. So that's the, that's the connection that needs to be set up uh, within, within the, uh, the global system to actually uh, uh, have impact on greenhouse gas emission reduction. We're putting out the CCDRs, that's the Country Climate Development 
reports uh, at, a, at a rapid clip. So China, China's came out yesterday, Vietnam's earlier in, the, uh, uh, in, in September, and, and a host of others. We've done 10 countries, and there'll be another 20 uh, by the uh, time of COP27, which we're building up for. Uh, and we were very pleased to have a, a major contribution from the U.S. on the Clean Technology Fund, which is one of the climate uh, trust funds. Um, and, and that's it on my list. So I, to summarize, uh, world facing very challenging environment from the advanced economies, uh, and that has uh, serious implications, dangers for the developing countries. And my uh, deep concern is that these conditions and trends might persist into 2023 and 2024. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go with the uh, woman in the gray jacket there in the middle, please. Thank you. No, behind. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for taking my question. It's Maolin Shang with Xinhua News Agency. I want to ask about uh, a possibility for a global recession. The World Bank uh, published in a recent uh, study that uh, the central banks are simultaneously hiking interest rates um, in, in response to inflation, and the global economy is heading toward might, uh, might uh, slip into recession in 2000, uh, 2023. And if that happens, what does it mean for low-income uh, economies especially, and how should they better react? Thank you. Thank you. The, the slowdown itself uh, of the world economy, it really hits uh, developing countries hard, and especially the poor in developing countries. So it's a negative impact. As far as the numbers I mentioned, we've, we, we've lowered our world GDP number for 2023 to 1.9%. That's a positive number. Uh, uh, that's, that's down 1.1% from where it was in June. Uh, but uh, uh, there's the risk of it going lower. World population growth, we estimate at 1.1% per year. Uh, and so if you get much slower in terms of world growth, that means people are going backward. Uh, and we already have, and I'll reemphasize, you know, the World Bank has a, has a mission of having shared prosperity, and that means in the broad sense, people's well-being going up. And the, the data from the poverty report shows median income going down for the first time. And so if we have a world recession now, uh, that would also depress median income, meaning the, the people in the lower half of the income scale are going down. I've been, one, one more point is, I've been concerned about the concentration of capital uh, in the world into the, the top end of the advanced economies. So that's, I think, one of the issues that the world has to deal with, to allow capital to flow to new businesses and to developing countries. That would take a change in the direction of, of uh, fiscal and monetary policies in the advanced economies. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to go to the front row here, the gentleman in the red tie, please. Yes, thank you for taking my question. My name is Simon Ateba with Today News Africa in Washington, D.C. Um, exactly to the point that you just made, the fact that we have hundreds of billions of dollars available for investment, but that money doesn't seem to flow to low-income countries, especially in Africa. I would like to talk a little bit more about the situation in South Island Africa, some of the policy recommendations, and some of the steps that the World Bank has taken to address some of the issues there, including the food crisis, energy prices, and the rest. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So let me give you some basics. In our fiscal 2022, which ended on June 30th, um, nearly half of the World Bank commitments were made to Africa. So that's a that's a change uh, that you know that's been happening over the years. A gradual shift in the in the uh, World Bank commitments uh, toward uh, fragile countries and in particular toward Africa. So we're doing. Uh, uh, so we've been expanding those programs as much as we can. Um, to your capital flow point, let me add one thought. Um, 
It, during the, when interest rates were being kept low by the world, there was a reach for yield. Uh, and so uh, it, investors were putting money into some of the emerging markets. But when you look at the data, it wasn't going into gross fixed capital formation. It was going often into government bonds in those countries. So if you think about the flow, it went from savers in the advanced economies to governments in the, in the uh, uh, developing countries and didn't actually create infrastructure and the, and the uh, new businesses that are needed to, to uh, increase production. So one of the things we're advocating now is just that uh, the uh, countries uh, in the developing world, and in particular in Africa, uh, look to use this, uh, th this challenge, this crisis uh, going on to improve their structural policies in order to, so that they can produce more in their countries. I think to get there, there would have to be more gross fixed capital formation. That means the actual physical investments and uh, educational investments within the countries in order to have future growth. One other point is the debt uh, crisis, and maybe we can talk about that with another question, but that, that overhangs uh, Africa, and I said in my opening why. You know, the interest rates are up, the burden of the debt is higher, and the currencies are weakening for quite a few of the countries, and the world doesn't have a technique now to provide debt relief even when debt is unsustainable. We've seen multiple countries trying to, asking the world community for debt relief and not finding a mechanism to do that. So that, that's particularly relevant to Africa. Great. All right, I'm gonna stick with, uh, looks like the front row, this gentleman here, please, thank you. And then I'm gonna to turn to an online question. Uh, good, good morning, I would like to ask in Arabic, please. In Arabic language. In Arabic? Yeah. Give us a second. Hmm. <laughs> I am Ahmed Ahmed uh, from Al Masdar newspaper in Egypt. My question is about Egypt uh, and the World Bank recently gave uh, 500 million dollars uh, to Egypt. Uh, we want to know more details about this 500 million dollars and is there any more provision in the near future and uh, what is your view for the Egyptian economy in general? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I don't know if everyone could hear it. So it was a question about Egypt and the World Bank did a loan uh, in the, I think it was in June, so it was in our fiscal uh, fourth quarter um, for Egypt. That the, as the food crisis hit in, uh, uh, well, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it drove up uh, food prices worldwide. And some country, and there was a differential impact on various countries based on how dependent they were on food from the Black Sea. Uh, Egypt was hit hard. Several countries were, and the World Bank moved very fast in April and May uh, to provide assistance. So we did uh, a Lebanon loan, we did the Egypt loan that was mentioned here, which included two things. It was uh, to, to help purchase wheat uh, because they, there was a shortage and bread is very important in Egypt, but then it also uh, uh, went to uh, uh, improvements in the food system within Egypt, and the government put forward some reforms that, that could help within future resilience for food crisis. We also did uh, s loans in Tunisia and also in East Africa. Uh, there, there was a $2.5 billion loan for food uh, security support in East Africa. This is part of our over of our, our overarching food security program uh, that I announced in Berlin, uh, it's 31 billion dollars that we will that we will commit to food security over the th over the 15 months starting in April, and so we're well along on that. I think we've done maybe nine billion of of that. So now the second part of the question was what could Egypt do? And e Egypt's facing the challenges that many developing countries uh, are. So I'll emphasize to the extent that there are subsidies within the economy that they
they be targeted and that there be an exit strategy from the subsidies. To the extent that there can be efficiency gains for state-owned enterprises, uh, that those be, those be done as quickly as possible. We, we stand ready to support uh, Egypt's uh, reform program uh, as, as, it, as it emerges. As the reforms are put forward, we can consider loans in various areas. The World Bank is, uh, is, uh, is, is uh, uh, moving very quickly to respond to the situation in the world, but it it, 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 there, there are steps that are needed in order to get to, uh, loans that, are, that can be taken to our board. Or, and I should emphasize to people, you know, the World Bank puts out a huge amount of our commitments in the form of grants. So, uh, so loans and grants go to the board, uh, but they have to, they, they need to have a quality that can improve the situation going forward, and we stand ready on that with Egypt. This involves the, the uh, fiscal uh, uh, policies, the state-owned enterprise policies, the efficiency of government spending, uh, the, the housing policies. We work in all areas uh, of that and look for opportunities to lend to uh, Egypt in this situation. Great. I'm turning to an online question real quick uh, from Mrs. Basan Seren from the Daily News, the largest daily in Mongolia. Uh, what are the key risks to the global economic out outlook in the near term and how will they impact small economies like Mongolia? Yeah. <laughs> like, well, Mongolia is, uh, is a sizable Her country. Words, uh, 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 small countries are sometimes uh, more price takers or they're, they're buffeted by the global situation. Oftentimes, they're also hit hard by climate. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, especially true of small island states where we, we work uh, um, and, uh, ambitiously and broadly with small island states. In the case of Mongolia, of course, they are, they are hit hard by the debt burden, by the rising interest rates. They've been, they had, have been borrowing heavily from China, which is a, its own set of uh, challenges in terms of, of that. Uh, and what the, I think, best for smaller countries would be if world growth were, were increased. And a key part of that is that there be that inflation, the inflation problem, and we saw it in this morning's U.S. numbers, that the inflation problem be addressed as quickly as possible, and including with more production. So, the you know even for Mongolia, the best thing that or one one supportive thing that the world could do is to have more production out of the United States, out of Canada, out of China, out of the big economies, because that, that addresses the inflation problem and that uh, would help get growth back on track. Great. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman here in the blue shirt with the hand up. Thank you. There's many blue shirts over there. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Chris Cermak with uh, Monocle Magazine and Radio. I w wanted to ask you a little more about Ukraine. You mentioned uh, the trust fund that has been set up. There was this ministerial yesterday. President Zelensky, one of the points that he asked for was insurance to also help not only public funds, but private funds, private investment get into Ukraine. Is that something you could comment on? How can the World Bank help to ensure public and private investment gets into Ukraine during this, this time? Yeah, this is an important problem. It's a complicated problem. The insurance takes many forms. So some insurance is for freight shipments going and can they be insured uh, in, in, a, uh, in a conflict zone. But, um, so I'll just speak on the, uh, for the World Bank, we have various insurance products. One is from MEGA, the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, and they're active in, uh, in Ukraine with some uh, insurance on political risk and on, on uh, events that can occur for, for Ukraine. And then uh, the, the World Bank itself uh, can, well, we are using donor guarantees right now, which is a form of insurance. Uh, the, you, just uh, by the end of this month, we'll disperse another, uh, another 500 million. We've, we've dispersed so far $11 billion to Ukrainian government, uh, uh, and there'll be an, another 500 million, uh, 530 million by the end of this month that, that is enabled by a guarantee from the UK government and also by assistance from Denmark. So uh, countries, many countries are participating in the uh, channeling of resources to Ukraine. 
Um, the, I, I, I don't want to neglect the International Finance Corporation, which I'm president of and is part of the World Bank Group, is active in Ukraine with the private sector, and some of that involves either insurance or things that operate as giving confidence to the market participants that are in Ukraine. So that, that also is an active program. Thanks. Um, end of the row here, please. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Nume Ikege from This Day Newspaper, Nigeria. So um, a general consensus is that um, so most SSA countries are at risk of debt or presently at um, debt distress. So if I can narrow it down to Nigeria, is um, where do we stand in, in our debt um, um, stance, basically, first, firstly? And then also, um, the Nigerian is, um, authorities is asking for debt restructuring. Is that something that will be considered by the World Bank? And also, if I can also add on um, on um, subsidies, energy subsidies in Nigeria, if it, the plan is to take it out next year, would it be too little, too late, or would you still further reiterate that it's it's taken out as soon as possible? Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll do it a little bit in reverse order. With regard to subsidies, uh, to the extent that governments can have them uh, be, be smaller, meaning not, uh, if, if you're putting a, a cap on gasoline prices, don't make it a nominal cap in the local currency terms, but allow it to, allow it to be reduced over time. So what the, the, the challenge in, for Nigeria is the, the subsidies are so large that they undermine the revenues coming to the government from the state-owned oil company. And uh, Nigeria is actually in a concerning situation because the, uh, the increase in the oil prices that occurred earlier this year uh, actually ended up hurting the finances of Nigeria because of that uh, large subsidy that's uh, provided. Um, the, with regard to the, to, to the uh, 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 debt restructuring, so the World Bank works very closely with the IMF on debt situations. Nigeria has not asked for the common framework under the G20 process. That process uh, has been has been slow acting in, in, in Chad and Ethiopia and Zambia. There's some signs of movement on Zambia, but uh, uh, still challenging. So Nigeria, nor and, and Ghana both did not ask for common framework treatment. Kristalina and I were talking uh, yesterday with uh, with the group about it part of the, the if if countries could have a situation where uh, the common framework uh, caused or allowed the country to uh, have a standstill on their debt uh, that would help the countries choose their their path forward on debt restructuring that would mean they would get a break on debt payments while they're working out a restructuring agreement with the with the world but Nigeria didn't go it hasn't gone that route um, some of the challenges on Nigeria and I've t talked you, you know been involved with with them for some time is the uh, the dual exchange rate or the multiple exchange rate that are used, that makes it very hard to have capital flowing uh, in an efficient way within the country. Also, the trade policies tend to be protective on the import side and, uh, uh, and uh, restrictive on the export side. Um, so we, will be, we would uh, work with the IMF on an assessment of the debt sustainability of Nigeria, but then it would also be up to Nigeria itself to interact with the various creditors, uh, which which uh, are, include bondholders, it includes official creditors uh, that, uh, that are engaged in, uh, in Nigeria. Thanks. Okay. Uh, in the middle third row, um, with the hand, yes, you stand up, David, thanks. Hi, uh, David Lauder with Reuters. Um, I just wanted to uh, go back to uh, my colleague's question here about Ukraine. Um, obviously, there's a, a lot of concern here about, about Ukraine and a lot of uh, pledges to, to keep up the flow of funds uh, to, keep, to keep them uh, afloat so they can battle this invasion. Um, I'm, I'm wondering though, we're also hearing from some other regions of the world that they see this money flowing all to Ukraine, um, you know, this European country, uh, yet they sort of feel maybe that they're a bit left out, uh, that they feel like uh, you know, countries in Africa, countries uh, Latin America, the Middle East uh, that are, are, are 
really struggling. I'm just wondering if you can uh, talk about um, you know this phenomenon and and you know are, are we sort of going a bit too far in that direction, um, or do you feel that all these problems are, are because of the war and the war needs to be ended first before you get to a lot of these other other problems? Thank you. Th thanks. Good question. And so, the answer is some of both, uh, but clearly the the the, uh, the war itself and Russia's invasion are causing massive problems for the world, uh, and so it's appropriate for the world to address that uh, and address that in a in a unified fashion. And that's what I was. Uh, uh, sensing yesterday, and the World Bank's very involved in that. But your question is exactly right, that others are affected by that. Are they being left out? I, I think we, World Bank Group, are trying to uh, uh, be cognizant and be expanding in in uh, all parts of the world, given the spillover of the crisis. Uh, for example, I, I went to Romania and Poland uh, early on, in maybe in April, because they were affected by the refugees coming out of Ukraine. But then also, we, I, I went to Morocco and Senegal, which were being hit hard uh, by the energy price uh, increase, the lack of natural gas shipments that affect the fertilizer flow within Africa. So we, the World Bank, have uh, programs uh, on food security. Uh, we, had a, we had an important event yesterday that included fertilizer. So one of the biggest African fertilizer producers was, was here, and we had a discussion of how can there be more uh, a more fertilizer appropriate to the crops uh, available in Africa, and there were specific uh, conversations. I met with the president of Togo yesterday, who that Togo has discovered phosphate, and that's a that's a key ingredient within uh, fertilizer. And there's an availability of natural gas from Nigeria or from Ghana that could be then used to make uh, fertilizer if that if the if that were a direction for the world. And so um, my we are working throughout the developing world on the debt problems, also on the private sector engagement problems that are so important for each of the countries. So I guess I'll push back a little on the, uh, oh, well, and then yesterday I met with the, the, the G7 had a, or had a meeting with the Compact with Africa countries, which are a, a group that Germany has been very involved in, but it's, uh, it, these are important countries within Africa, and what can be done to help there, there's, there's 12 in, in that group. I'll be meeting today with the, or uh, sometime, uh, what, what, today or tomorrow, um, with the uh, African, uh, uh, the, the group of uh, African governors that are here, uh, and so there's, there's a major focus uh, I, in fact, I would say, to be clear, David, there's, there's one event that there was an event yesterday on Ukraine, but w if we look throughout the week, we've got seven active days of meetings of the World Bank IMF, and th 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 those other meetings are constant and will be on other parts of the world. Thanks. Okay. Um, front row in the middle there. Hi. Um, Wait for the mic. Thanks. Lee Harris with the American Prospect. Um, so Secretary Yellen signaled some potential expansion of bank lending capacity, which she suggested could scale up lending in the tens of billions of dollars. I wonder how prepared are you to increase risk appetite, including by relaxing the commitment, uh, the sort of perhaps excessive commitment to AAA ratings, uh, and specifically holding SDRs to expand lending, among other capital adequacy changes. Uh, how much additional lending do you think those measures could unlock? And can you respond to reporting by Reuters that the bank tried to suppress the G20 review on capital adequacy frameworks? Yeah. Thank you. Let, let me take that point first. So we work uh, actively with the G20. The G20 has constant meetings all the time. And so the idea of suppressing a report isn't uh, correct at all. The World Bank participated actively with the, it's called the in, in, uh, the uh, IFA working group. So that's the International Finance uh, Architecture Working Group of the G20, which is a permanent working group that had many meetings on these topics. And the World Bank participated fully and was 
uh, and led, there, there was unity among the multilateral development banks on the ways to respond within that capital adequacy framework discussion. We are, have already engaged with our board on discussions of the, uh, the findings and the outcomes of that capital adequacy, uh, that CAF report. So that was discussed yesterday. And so we, we embraced the, the concept of how do you get more resources. We understand how vital it is for for people in, de in the developing world. You know, I've, I've gone through, we've, we've been talking about the cutoff of resources that's coming from capital flows, from the markets being closed to various countries, and this, the big challenge, I call it a crisis in development. So one of the solutions is more resources, including more resources through the World Bank. We'll be talking with shareholders about the ways to, the ways to do that. That gets into the callable capital of the World Bank and other other multilateral development banks, how can it be best utilized? Uh, you know, the World Bank uh, is, le leverages more than the other multilateral development banks. So we, we, we have a five, uh, well, uh, to give you one statistic, uh, in, since its inception, the paid-in capital, the amount of cash uh, paid into the IBRD, the, the bank portion of the World Bank, is $20 billion, and the commitments that have been made from that are $820 billion. Now, that's the combination that's made possible by the callable capital, principally of the United States. It's also made possible by the, uh, uh, by the earnings earnings of the bank. So as the bank earned over the years, it was put into retained earnings, and that allowed more l lending to be, taken, to be taken over time. So we're looking at all the techniques to expand the resources, and we actually welcome that uh, discussion uh, that's, uh, that's ongoing. As far as SDRs, we, we, we've engaged with the IMF from the beginning on e SDRs with uh, looking for solutions to the technical issues that block the, uh, 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 that block the uh, use of SDRs on the, on the balance sheet. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we've got time for one more. I'm sorry we got a late start. I've got a call on Press Trust of India for the last question, please. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. I would like to ask you about your assessment of India's economic situation and how some of the flagship programs like digitization and direct cash transfer has been helpful in poverty alleviation of the role for that. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So notable in our recent poverty report was that some countries had been able to soften the blow on poverty uh, that was caused by COVID uh, by, through cash transfer systems and digitalization. So I, th I think we should uh, uh, recognize the importance of digitalization within the world uh, because it allows even the even poor countries uh, to have a connection with people around the country. It's a connection that wasn't available before this digitalization. And in, India has taken good advantage of that to create uh, uh, social protection programs that reach the poor. And that, that showed up in the data uh, from 2020 that uh, as COVID hit, uh, there were there were programs that helped soften the blow on on uh, on the poor. So we welcome that. I think India can do lots more on the administrative side to create efficiencies uh, both within the federal federal government and the civil service of India and within the state the various state level. Uh, and World Bank works actively with both with the federal government, but also actively with the state governments on ways to uh, ways to address poverty, ways to address stunting, uh, ways to address water uh, and electricity, and also climate adaptation. Uh, all of these are core issues of our program in India. Take one more. Take one more. Great. Okay. Um, Going to go. Uh, I think over here, please. Thank you. Yes, you go ahead. Hi there, Alexa Angelis with Fox Business. Um, so Europe has pivoted and started investing in fossil fuel infrastructure. Do you feel that this will ease the energy instability in the region quickly enough, or does Europe need more help from the U.S. with increased production here? Uh, um, 
Well, notable within the global context is the, the importance of energy in it. Uh, and so as, as uh, Europe was dependent on, on uh, uh, Russia for not just natural gas, but also for oil and for coal, it creates a major challenge for, for Europe in terms of their, uh, their economic slowdown and in terms of how do they replace that energy. Um, there, there's a new pipeline from Norway to Poland, which is bringing, uh, br br bringing fresh supplies. There, there's active uh, talk by e Europe of ways to bring in more uh, LNG, liquefied natural gas. Uh, and as you mentioned, there, there is talk in Europe of more production uh, in Europe itself. But I think as we look at it, we, the general point I'd like to make is just w faced with inflation and high energy prices, uh, and the, the world needs to think in terms of cleaner fuels and transition fuels in order to help uh, help move the world forward. Less carbon intensive fuels uh, as, as the solution and the direction for the world. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Very much. Thanks everybody, good to see you.